And I'm going to hand the podium over to Mike Robinson. Um, Mike uh, uh, is responsible for having um, started the Atmosphere to Electron program, and he is going to um, moderate this panel. So I'll hand it over to you, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me also welcome you to the very first panel of the day. We call this the DOE panel. Most of our um, invited speakers are going to be from DOE. Uh, the subtitle of this particular panel, the research challenges, the investments in atmospheric sciences that we need to go forward. I'm sure a topic of interest for everyone. We have three distinguished speakers. Mike Derby is gonna be talking a little bit about DOE's vision and the R&D challenges that are remaining in wind energy. Uh, Shannon Davis, he'll be talking about the future of atmospheric sciences research at DOE and some of the future investments, especially as we move going towards offshore. And Sue Hopp is going to end the panel with a discussion on the current um, R&D activities, especially the mesoscale and microscale program that is ongoing um, at DOE. By way of introduction, here are some slides of our panelists. Sue is a senior scientist and deputy director of the National Center of Atmospheric Sciences. She's the lead principal investigator on our largest collaborative in atmospheric sciences, the mesoscale and microscale program. And you'll be hearing a little bit about um, what her and her team are doing in this particular area. And then she'll also be touching on where that program is going as we move to the offshore arena. The newest member of the team is uh, Shannon Davis. Shannon is an atmospheric scientist. And he is leading the DOE wind program. He's the newest member of the technology leadership team back at DOE. He just joined us a couple months ago. He does have ex extensive experience in atmospheric sciences um, and wind-related R&D activity. His previous position at Woodhull Oceanographic Institute, uh, a lot of the work he did included both data collection and analysis, as well as numerical simulation. And he's going to talk a little bit about the vision for the investments in atmospheric research and where the program will be headed in the future. And our last speaker, um, or I should say our first speaker is Mike Derby. Mike actually leads the entire R&D and T portfolio. So all the different um, sub program activities that Bob Marley mentioned were land offshore and distributed wind Mike's responsible for both the basic and the applied research portfolios that are sponsored through DOE for these different activities. Um, this includes not only the um, programs themselves, but all the major test facilities um, that are located at the national laboratories and all the associated infrastructure needed to take on this research portfolio. And so by way of kickoff, Mike is going to lead off the panel and talk a little bit about the outstanding remaining challenges in wind technology and touch on the needs in the atmospheric sciences community. So Mike, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, you can see my screen. You're good. All right, thanks, Mike. Appreciate the introduction. And Sue, thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the remaining R&D challenges that uh, we see for the wind energy. And um, you know, Bob talked a lot about the, uh, the overarching program. I'm going to dive into you know, a little more detail about kind of the uh, pathway that we see for um, making some of these uh, concepts of reality. So as we look at, um, you know, key wind energy challenges, um, you know, part of it is just the absolute scale that we're dealing with. Um, certainly wind energy is already a major source of electricity and, um, you know, we're building up decades of research, but there's still further research that's needed to move forward. Um, as yeah, so we continue to scale and build larger and larger turbines and expand into 
new areas of uh, resource in the country, um, some key challenges remain. Part of that is you know, characterizing and understanding the atmospheric flow and stability and tur turbulence that happens at hub heights. Um, that's kind of essential to, to what we need um, as far as information goes to continue to advance the technology. Everything's dependent upon that. Enhanced forecasting also um, is important for our ability to um, integrate additional wind energy onto the grid. Uh, there's more and more variable generation um, gets incorporated. We, we need to be able to predict when that's going to be available and what the load's going to be and try to marry those two. And yet the, the span of um, scales, both spatially and temporally, are enormous here. We work on a global weather scale. We come down to a wind plant scale, a mesoscale processes. We need to move that down to the flow within a wind plant and how turbines interact with one another, down to how an individual turbine responds to the air and the aerodynamics that happen along the, the span of a blade. And all of that goes right back out into the grid and back out to a, more of a, a, a mesoscale um, system. And all of this um, also leads to the fact we can't ignore the siting and environmental impacts as uh, our technology grows into new areas, there's going to be new environmental issues, uh, both with wildlife, humans, and uh, radar interactions. So I want to focus uh, today's chat on just one particular pathway. Now, this isn't, um, you know, a uh, necessarily the thing that DOE is working on, but I just wanted to give an example of uh, what it takes to to get to a new future. So just kind of in, imagine a uh, notional 20 megawatt floating offshore platform. 60% of the offshore resources for the US are in what are called deep waters. That's more than 65 meters deep. And that depth of water um, is probably going to require floating platforms in order to be cost effective. The west coast of the U.S. is almost 100% in deep water. So in order to take advantage of that, we're going to have to move the floating platforms. Already, uh, turbines are out there that are 14 megawatts. And just, you know, in 2014, six years ago, the biggest turbines were around 7 megawatts. Today, we're talking about 12 to 14 megawatt turbines. 20 megawatt turbines are probably not too far in our future. So this isn't this isn't going to be out there that much that much longer. Bigger machines are already on the drawing board. So let's think about what a 20 megawatt turbine might look like. You know, we're looking at blades that are probably 130 meters long. The rotor diameter is going to be close to 270 meters. The tower might be about 175 meters above the surface. And it's going to weigh probably on the order of 800 metric tons. The generator at the top of the nacelle is going to be over 500 metric tons. That whole nacelle assembly up there, 1,000 metric tons. Foundation, um, you know, we don't know what the foundations are going to look like. Bob talked about this earlier. Perhaps 70,000 metric tons. This is a massive machine, and the rotor tip spans from 40 meters above the surface all the way up to 310 meters above the surface. Almost uh, 900 feet from tip to, to the bottom. And it's turning at about six or eight RPM. So the blade makes a complete revolution about every 10 seconds. It's spanning that entire flow field in 10 seconds. Now the amount of beer and shear that takes place over that, the turbulence difference between the top and the bottom, that makes for a very challenging problem. So how are we going to deal with this? I mean, what's what's how do we make this happen? Um, you know, this is one of the largest, most flexible machines in the world. And we're talking about having a massive spinning gyro on top of a stick that's bobbing on a cork out in the ocean. 
you know, what, what can possibly be the challenges with making something like that happen? So we're gonna need high fidelity modeling. Um, it's really difficult for us to do tests on this kind of a machine. What would be very useful would be able to do high fidelity modeling with a lot of physics captured in that. So we have a good understanding of how this is gonna perform. But we need to turn that into something useful for designers. We need design tools. We need the ability to capture the relevant physics. We can't use high fidelity modeling to design machines. It's too expensive computationally. We don't have the resources to do that. But our design tools today need to incorporate fully coupled aerodynamics and hydrodynamics in order to capture what's happening on a turbine like this. We need to be able to scale all of these components up. We've got a make blades you know, another 30% longer. Um, towers have to be taller. All of these scaling parameters add up to more and more weight. And we need to reduce the amount of weight that's happening. The uh, control systems for these need to be able to capture what's happening in the wind turbine wakes and be able to mitigate those effects from one turbine to the next. We need to be able to understand how one wind plant interacts with another. We need to be able to reduce the overall weight and cost of these machines. Now, DOE doesn't design machines. We don't build machines. We don't operate machines. What we try to do is provide the tools to industry and the knowledge that they can take advantage of what we've learned in order to develop and modify design all of this technology. As I mentioned earlier, you know, increased levels of um, variable generation are gonna present challenges to the grid. We need to be able to predict the power generation. And this power generation prediction needs to, to cover a span of temporal scales as well. So, you know, how much power is a pint gonna generate over the course of its life in order to understand what the finances are? How much power does it generate seasonally, weekly, daily, hourly? In order to integrate this into the grid, it's critical for cost competitive uh, wind to be able to understand how much power is gonna be available over the next day. We need to be able to understand what a gust front is coming through and so how we're gonna integrate that onto the grid. There's also a real need to understand what's going to happen when we get more and more inverter-based generation on the grid. Um, the stability of the grid is very critical to how inverter-based generation is going to interact with it. When you lose all of the synchronous uh, generators from like coal and gas power plants and move more and more to inverter-based, a lot of that stability that's that's generated from the, the mass of the spinning generators lost. And being able to understand how a wind plant is gonna interact with the grid, how it reacts to the wind during that time frame, it's gonna be critical to more and more wind on the grid. All of these lead to needing a better understanding of how a wind plant interacts with turbines one-on-one -on -one with one another and how wind plants interact with, with each other. And all of this, of course, is impacted by complex terrain, um, the effects of uh, wakes on one another. Our ability to model this is, um, is dependent on improvements in our ability to do the atmospheric modeling. Wind turbine wakes, cause up to 10% energy loss within a wind plant. Uh, we have wake uncertainty of 20 to 50% that kind of leads to a two to 5% uh, uncertainty in energy production. And, you know, Orsted actually made a, a public comment that they felt they were um, over predicting their energy estimates by 2%. That's a huge impact on the financial bottom line. Their uh, estimation was that it was due to blockage effects and wake effects. So our plants today are designed with limited physics and 
we just don't really understand that transition across the terra incognita, trying to scale turbulence down from global weather patterns to what's happening in a wind plant. And our, our weather forecast models really aren't geared towards wind energy forecasting. They're not designed to understand what are the winds at hub heights. And we also need to incorporate the uh, wind and wave interactions as we move offshore. Instead of being on a uh, thick surface now, we're on a surface that's that's ever changing and interacts with this, the, the wind. And it's gonna be critical for us to understand how that couples with the floating platform dynamics. So it all starts here with atmospheric science. And this is the key to what we're trying to do. In complex terrain, we have a, a very, very difficult challenge. Uh, wind turbines get sided based on the complex terrain and flow accelerations that are happening. So we move offshore, the marine atmospheric boundary layer is not well understood. We've got coastal low level jets, radiative cooling, coastal circulations and sea breezes, warm waters coming up from the Gulf Stream along the East Coast, temperature variations that all impact the um, stability and the flow offshore. And we don't have a lot of data that helps us to understand what's going on in that space. The mesoscale to microscale coupling is key to capturing some of this wind plant flow physics and being able to understand what the not only the gross wind patterns are but also how to move those turbulent features down to the wind plant level and how that's going to impact it so all of the technology advancement that we need to do is predicated on really understanding atmospheric flow and turbulence we need to master the physics of wind flow that's going to enable us to continue to scale some of the most large, largest, most flexible machines that have ever been built. And it's critical to understanding how to control these machines and to integrate all this energy onto the grid. So DOE's plan is to continue aggressive cost reduction for all of these technologies to work on ultra large, ultra light, lightweight floating wind plants and to develop electrical energy and grid services that are able to be integrated onto the grid. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, very much. Um, for the audience, please hold your questions to the end of the presentation for all speakers. Um, make a little note. And Michael, if you will stop sharing your screen, if you've done so already. And uh, Shannon, you're up next. And Shannon, you're on mute. Matt. Can you see my screen? You're good. Okay. Hang on. Okay, um, good morning. Um, we're very uh, honored to be here and uh, to speak with you today. Um, as Mike and Mike uh, mentioned, I am the, the new arrival at the um, Wind Energy Technologies Office at DOE. And uh, to kind of underscore that, I, I included a picture of the new office, uh, which is as much as I've seen of it in the, in the two months since I've arrived here. Ironically, so you're seeing as much as I have, and um, but that's okay. This is an extraordinary time, and uh, I've been uh, really having a great experience thus far uh, coming on board and joining an amazing group of uh, an amazing team at the headquarters, as well as uh, a dynamic group of engineers and scientists in wind power research. And uh, though I am new to the wind, uh, new to WIDO, and new to the Department of Energy. I have been working in uh, wind research for quite some time, and I'm coming here from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, 
where I've been a scientist researching lower atmospheric dynamics and winds over complex terrain. I've also been looking at air-sea processes and structures in the marine atmospheric boundary layer and looking at how they influence atmospheric transport. And this goes back to my PhD time at the University of New Hampshire as well, and using mesoscale and climate scale, mesoscale models to climate scale models to simulate the processes that we observed and, and learn more about the 3D and 4D nature of them. I've also been involved in trying to improve the model performance using remote sensing data sets like uh, surface uh, winds over the ocean. These are a few snapshots of some of my favorite uh, projects that I've been able to work on, um, deploying an air sea uh, buoy in the Red Sea off the coast of Saudi Arabia, as well as building a coastal meteorological tower and running some more simulations to capture the, the dynamic land sea breeze that occurs there and is enhanced by the topography on both sides of the basin. Also, during my PhD time, I was really lucky to be part of a, a large scale interagency and international field campaign called ICART, the International Consortium for Atmospheric Research and, and Transport, where we did some uh, aircraft profiles and, and uh, remote and um, research vessel observations of winds over the Gulf of Maine and the, the North Atlantic. And this experience and, and the dynamic uh, exchange I've had in the two months coming on board have shaped what I see as the Direction for Atmospheric Sciences and the WIND program in the near to, to moderate future. Um, a lot of it is based on what's already been, what I've been able to see is already going on. And that's that uh, the program is advancing research that, that, that leads and supports an evolving wind energy technology a suite. I think one of the, the, the most amazing things is how they've been able to innovate uh, new capabilities in atmospheric and wind modeling. And we're gonna hear a lot about that in the course of the workshop and as well as provide new data and new data access in, in, uh, um, in conjunction with the new computational tools and numerical uh, model code uh, that's, that's being developed. I think that's gonna be essential to um, uh, supporting the growing size of the, of the um, offshore wind projects that, as Mike uh, laid out just before me. And I'd like to say that one of the things I'm really amazed at was that I think this will build on the foundation of the current successes. And by that, I really like would have been really impressed by what was accomplished during the atmosphere to electrons uh, project. And I mean, it's it's not over yet. It's it's kind of reaching its apex and, and uh, uh, but it's been an extraordinary achievement. I mean, even though it was kind of, uh, um, the objective was simply to, uh, to, to, to optimize the power production of wind plants, use atmospheric science to, tools to optimize the, the wind power uh, production and how and their interaction with uh, other turbines, I think it's been an amazing achievement in the collaboration between different entities and wind uh, research science, especially the comprehensive, the multi-lab, the multi-project program that it, that, that it encompassed, and the collaboration and coordination that it occurred between federal agencies, different industry uh, partners, as well as academia. And with this foundation and, uh, and, and the collaborations that were established in ADE, I think um, we're in a good position to, to face a number of the challenges in atmospheric science that face wind power in the future. You're gonna hear a lot about wind source characterization or, or in better, better character, characterization of the lower atmosphere. And so what does that actually mean? Um, that means that we're gonna need new observations, um, more field campaigns and new types of measurements and observational platforms. As Mike mentioned earlier, that uh, we're and we're going to be looking at new ways that we can represent physics in the models. And one of the key components is going to be improved surface atmospheric coupling. And we're going to have to be able to resolve local turbulence, which is going to vary on a site by site basis and vary over time dynamically. We're also going to have to uh, enhance our ability to observe and simulate the flows in me from mesoscale to microscale, which is the which has been the focus of the MMC group. And this means that we're gonna be looking at the flows from the rotor aerodynamics all the way to the weather scale phenomenon. And methods to couple of those are gonna be extremely important. And this is one of the milestones I think we'll be talking, you'll hear about later in some of the breakout sessions of the workshop. And this is kind of a throw out to, uh, to the fact that we're gonna be, as we move, move offshore, we're gonna to have to increase our awareness and the relationships uh, between the wind farm and the environment around it and this involves not only uh, processes like 
interannual and interdecadal variations, but we're going to be working in a two fluid environment, geophysical fluid environment, which is always changing. And that understanding those relationships is going to be crucial to the long term planning and, and productivity of, of the resource. So one of the recent tools that's been um, been deployed from the Department of Energy as the uh, as a pair of uh, of DOE lidar buoys, which have been able to provide new information about the marine atmospheric boundary layer and complete two uh, two related field campaigns off the East Coast, one off the coast of New Jersey and one off the coast of Virginia. The buoys have been able to provide uh, wind profiles, giving us uh, data sets from from six different levels and as well as near surface meteorological conditions and oceanic uh, uh, states, as well as wave height periods and a directional spectrum. And the wave wind interaction is another uh, challenge uh, in, the, in the ARC coupling that's definitely gonna be prominent in the atmospheric science research uh, to come. They've also, and amazingly, in the, amidst the whole COVID epidemic, they were they've been able to be redeployed or, or recovered and redeployed off the Northwest coast. And this happened in the course of the past month. And the data is, is becoming available. I encourage you to look at it online at the, uh, the data access portal that DOE has set up, websites here below. And working in concert with new observations and new observational platforms is our efforts to, to improve numerical models and develop them, develop uh, new methods for using models to improve the wind plant performance and improve the characterization of the wind resource. And uh, the MMC project uh, has been working in the space of uh, micro, mesoscale to microscale uh, physics, and they're the critical conveyor of the um, getting the official essential physics from uh, that influence the hub height winds uh, to the high fidelity modeling uh, of the plant inflow and uh, as well as the wake effects and which can also be used for informing future turbine designs. So th this is just a sketch of what I think you're going to hear some more details from Sue and, and, and the rest of the MMC group of how they've been able to pioneer new techniques for modeling the micro to mesoscale um, connection both in both ways is and use this in model development as well as validation and analysis. They've done an amazing job of doing this already over complex of uh, uh, terrain and, and the interactions between localized flows and wake effects that uh, to optimize uh, the performance of uh, turbines and, and accurately predict the output. They've been developing new uh, schemes for middle scale models such as a 3D boundary layer scheme and they're also using advanced techniques such as machine learning to, to uh, pursue new ways to, of atmospheric modeling and, and atmospheric modeling improvements. As, and another project that's, that's, that I hope will be mentioned later on was the development of new dynamical core for um, the energy research and forecasting models, which will be cap capable of simulating and predicting the flows across the mesoscale to microscale spectrum. And with that, I'd like to say thanks, and I'd be willing to take any questions later on? Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate it very much. The uh, last presentation will be done by Sue Hopp. Sue has done a tremendous job in the in leading the group in the meso to microscale coupling, which is of course um, the organization that's hosting this conference in conjunction with DOE. And so she's going to spend a little bit of time talking about the progress that they have made and the many participants and their relative contributions from the various laboratories across the DOE complex. Sue, all yours. And Sue, you're on mute. Thank you, Mike. You can see my slides, I presume? Yes, you're good. Okay. Um, thank you, Shannon, for leading beautifully into the conversation on mesoscale to microscale coupling. This is a team that has been working together for about five years now, um, comprised of, at any one time, four to five DOE national labs plus NCAR, which is an NSF-sponsored national lab currently, we're working with Pacific North Northwest National Lab, uh, Lawrence Livermore, um, National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, 
and Los Alamos National Lab. But I do want to mention that Argonne National Lab has contributed to the research as well. We have a team of really excellent researchers that have been working together looking at how we can model to obtain energy from the atmosphere in, in ways that are useful. Okay, so for instance, where is that energy in the atmosphere? Most of the energy is actually at the global scales. If you look at an energy spectrum, you'll see that these passing weather systems are what contain large amounts of the energy. You can see the small scale motion here too, but those large scales contain huge amounts of energy. And it's transferred down into continental scales. And we see those such as these path passing weather systems that we can model going across the continents. But then the energy passes down toward wind plant scale where the turbulence is more than just an inflow, but it's an undulating change in the atmosphere. And it's a very dynamic type of flow. We see changes even at those wind plant scales that are huge and must be considered when we're trying to figure out how to harvest that energy from the wind. And of course, that energy then flows into the, the scales that impact the turbines themselves. Not only, we're not talking about a, a constant wind coming at those turbines, but rather this turbulent environment that is fed from those larger scales. Now, of course, the flow from the large scales to the small scales is not the only direction. We have an inverse cascade as well where the, the energy flows back up to the larger scales. So how do we model across these scales? We've been challenged to couple the mesoscale, which of course has the boundary conditions of the global scale, to the micro scale or the wind plant scale. For the mesoscale, we're using the weather research and forecasting model. For the micro scale, we've been using multiple um, resolutions on the order of 100 meters and below within WARF, a large eddy simul simulation, Malouin, SOFA, and moving to AMRX now. Now, we start with data. We want to model the real atmosphere. So we choose to model real data, beginning with flat terrain, the SWIFT facility in Texas, moving toward complex terrain, leveraging data collected by the Wind Forecast Improvement 2 project, and now moving toward the offshore environment where there will be much development in the future as we've seen from the prior talks. Now, what do we have to do? We're, we're selecting cases to see how we model those across, from the meso to the micro from these series of measurements. We need to select concurrent surface and boundary conditions that are true for both. And then we need to model this area in between the, called the terra incognita or gray zone. And that generally is this area between um, about a thousand meters to on the order of a hundred meters. And I'll talk a little bit more about the terra incognita a little bit later. And then we need to initialize turbulence at these fine scales because it is not resolved at the larger scales. Now, of course, we'd have to ground it in, in solid verification, validation, including uncertainty quantification, so that the goal is to produce more realistic forcing of those turbulent resolving eddies. And that can, uh, through the effect of coupling, of those mesoscale to microscale. So what we expect to do is develop better models and coupling techniques for these wind plan simulations. These can be used for improved resource assessment planning, plan designing the wind plants and their layout, 
enabling steering and control so we can optimize operation of these. And one thing that is not on here, but we're moving in that direction is for the grid integration itself, modeling at the higher resolutions, where since our computers are, are um, going faster, we're developing models that go faster. In other realms, such as wildfire modeling, we're already um, able to, to model orders of 100 meters in faster than real time. Now, the team plans to provide open source tools that will be usable by industry and research. So Python tools for standardizing data simulation and analysis, assessment tools. We've already developed a series of Python tools to assess the output of these model runs. And um, working with the energy resource and forecasting team, a mesoscale common cold code that is optimized for wind energy needs so that we can get this more realistic forcing. Now, I'm going to very rapidly cover a few of the issues that are involved. One is the terra incognita that I brought up. Um, it, it, and, and the issue here is the mesoscale models, if you use a resolution that is in this terra incognita, will display numerical artifacts or spurious rolls, especially like you see here in this 333 meter simulation. Also, in this particular case, um, observable at one kilometer. So those are not real. How do we get rid of those? How can we think about that? Tomorrow, Raj Ray is going to talk a little bit more about how he crafted some numerical experiments on real cases where he looked at different resolutions for several convective cases and found that in this terra incognita zone, the upper limit is actually roughly the height of the boundary layer. And that's a new result in the literature. It makes sense that we're only able to resolve those eddies that are within the boundary layer. That makes sense. More energy is observed at the micro scale than when it's coupled to the mesoscale nest. So again, an important result. You'll hear more about it tomorrow. What are the best coupling strategies as we're trying to bring these models together? Now, of course, the, the advantage of the mesoscale models is they capture the full variability, the large scale flow. We have radiation package, we have full physics, we have surface layer, we have boundary layer process, all modeled, um, you know, parameterized in these models, as well as cloud physics, which actually have impact on the dynamics. But we need the micro scale models to capture the flow around the objects uh, so that we can use it for the controls and, and designing for loads and doing the details of the siting. So the idea is we want the micro scale model to follow the dynamically changing mesoscale model. There's two approaches that we've uh, focused on. One is nesting where we directly embed the large eddy simulation in the mesoscale code, such as in WARF LES. But then the other one, inspired um, by the Wake Bench project, we've also been directly forcing the large eddy simulation code uh, separately with tendencies supplied by the mesoscale code. And we find that when we use that tendency approach, and this is in SOFA done by NREL. Look at the time here, the local time, and you'll see as, as we progress from morning and the small scale turbulence, we develop these turbulent rolls. As time goes closer to noon, we begin to get uh, the, the convective cells. The cells get larger over time. But then as the sun is beginning to set closer to for local time, they condense again. We see some rolls before we go back to that fine scale turbulence. And we're able to get this type of simulation because it was coupled to the dynamic mesoscale model. Okay, also mentioned that we aren't able to generate, you know, to to see the turbulence at the micro scale originally when we couple it to the mesoscale because the mesoscale doesn't resolve that turbulence. 
So how are we going to develop that? You see on the top one where we don't uh, do anything to develop that turbulence. Half of our domain is taken up just trying to start up the turbulence. It takes that huge fetch and in these very expensive micro scale runs, we don't want to be able to doing that, do that. So we develop stochastic temperature perturbations, also momentum perturbations that we've been studying. And you see that the turbulence develops much faster. There's other methods, parameterizations that we've been testing as well, including the MAN method. Um, Domingo Manas Esperazzo will talk more about this tomorrow. And what about when we come to complex terrain? Can we model effectively over complex terrain, such as in this W52 region in the Pacific Northwest of the US, and particularly in the Lee of Mount Hood is really interesting, where we know we develop wakes and waves and very fine scale features. And when we do this nesting, we are able to capture the turbulence. And when we plot the energy spectra through the effective resolution, we have quite good agreement between the model results and um, where we, we see uh, where it was observed. Now, again, we are in, uh, developing this fully three-dimensional planetary boundary layer scheme as well. And when, when we use that within WARF, we're able to capture details of this meandering um, wake in the lee of Mount Hood. You also can look along the edges and see standing waves along the ridge but then you're, you have these waves, some of them standing, some of them traveling, very complex flow that we're able to simulate because of this 3D PBL scheme that we've developed. Now, Shannon also mentioned we're, we're moving to using AI methods as part of this. And one of the places where there's lowest hanging fruit is in the surface layer scheme. Traditionally, we use Mononubikov similarity theory to model the surface layer. And, and, and that has been uh, you know, generally worked, but what it does is it uses similarity theory to come up with general relationships. And then you have to fit the empirics based on observations. And those observations have typically been taken in flat terrain, such as in Kansas. But we, when you plot um, you know, the, these, the functions um, for different stabilities. We show huge variations, tons of scatter. So this is a place where there's low hanging fruit to try machine learning. And can we use machine learning? Well, we're testing it at two different sites, one at Kaba in the Netherlands and the other one at Schofield, Idaho in the US. And the idea is to fit random forest and artificial neural networks to each site. We don't have time to show a lot of results here, but David John Gagne will talk more about it in the AI breakout tomorrow. And indeed, we look here at the Mononubikov uh, similarity in terms of R squared, in terms of mean absolute error, reduce MAE as low as possible, R squared as close to one as possible. We're showing here the random forest when we train on the site, we see that for all variables, it's very, we, we beat um, the MO theory. But what is, and the same is true at the Kaba site. But what's really interesting is if we take the random forest that was trained at Kaba and apply it to the Idaho site, it's still a lot better. So in conclusion, both the random forest and the artificial network uh, significantly outperformed the MO theory. And that was true even when applied to a site different than where it was trained. It can be used as a model parameterization. Now, as we heard from Mike, we need to be moving toward modeling in the offshore environment because that's the future of where we're going to be harvesting wind. 
So this year in fiscal year 2020, the team has been looking at what's been done and getting data from an offshore environment. We chose the Fino Towers off the coast of Europe. There is the Alpha Ventus farm. Uh, we were able to obtain data from that. We reviewed lots of data, came up with a two week period from 2010 where we did have turbulence data. We did a lot of mesoscale modeling, modified the WARF model, adding an algorithm for offshore surface roughness, did lots of sensitivity studies looking at best uh, setups for this offshore environment. We compared the data to towers. We're in the process of doing micro scale runs. We're going to embed turbines in these runs. You'll be hearing more about all this tomorrow as well. The machine learning team trained to data. And we find much as, as I showed for the land-based machine learning that we also were able to, using both the random forest and the artificial neural net, we still were able to be the Mononuba cross similarity theory. So the offshore environment is prime for doing a lot of these simulations that we've done onshore. The team has been holding workshops such as this. We've had webinars for industry. We've written five annual reports that are posted as PNNL lab reports. Um, we're in the midst of writing the sixth of those journal publications, lots of conference publications, disseminating this so it can be used by everyone else. Want to point out that this mesoscale to microscale coupling is essential to get that energy transfer from the large scales to the scales that we care about for wind energy. We, we've thought about terra incognita. We've thought about coupling methods, stochastic perturbations, and how to model surface layer, uh, 3D PBL schemes. And now we're addressing issues in the offshore environment. So thank you. Thank you, Sue. What a great summary and overview for the program and uh, a great teasers for the information that's about to come. Um, my compliments and appreciation to all the uh, speakers for staying on time. We have a few minutes for a couple of quick questions, if you have it, before I turn the podium over to Carolina. Does someone have any questions from any of the panel members or for Bob Marley, who did the opening remarks in terms of the technology overview and where the program might be going? First question I have is for you, Sue. What are the inputs for the MI for surface layer? Okay, so that's, um, you'll hear more about it tomorrow in the AI breakout, but you have to have the right data, which is why it's hard to get data um, to do this type of machine learning. You have to be able to infer the fluxes of mass momentum and energy across the surface. So you need to be able to measure each of those at at least two levels. Now we've found, you know, and of course we have temperature pressure, all the standard atmospheric variables, but to be able to get that flux to, and, and the um, variables that are actually the target variables are three non-dimensional variables, um, the friction velocity, a temperature scale and a moisture scale. And that's what you calculate the fluxes from, but you need to be able to reconstruct it. And um, you know, I would like to advocate for more long-term um, data uh, at multiple locations of different types we were glad to be able to obtain data from both Schofield, Idaho and Kabah. But uh, you know, to do the machine learning for the offshore environment, we had to do a lot of theoretical inference. And Bronco Kosovic, um, I want to recognize for coming up with the theoretical background to be able to do that. Thank you, Sue. Quick question for you, Shannon. Um, how similar uh, was the work that you were doing while you were at Woods Hole in terms of offshore 
and the R&D that's going to be required for us to make progress on the green boundary layer um, within the wind program? What are the similarities? Where do you think programs are going to go? It, it was surprisingly very similar, Mike. Um, it's uh, um, looking at a lot of the features that uh, uh, that Sue and Mike had, had, had outlined in their talks it, were um, very comparable to a lot of the experiments that we had been uh, looking at. Uh, I think that the the um, the focus on the 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 missing physics the, that you could capture on the and the observations at the RC interface and the um, the model's ability to or not a, or inability to to capture those physics was a um, was a shared challenge and so it's a um, a lot of the a lot of the the the, the resources are 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 very similar and a lot of the the focus was very was very much in line with what was going on for for wind ener energy research right now and i think it's it'll it'll um so it's i think it's a good match great shannon thank you um and let me uh pass along we're running a little bit over um if anybody has any follow-up questions we will in fact post the questions and the responses um, after the conference is over. And so please don't hesitate if you think of other additional comments or um, any other additional questions you might have for the panel members, please pass them along to us and we'll get those out and posted.